my name's Holly and I head up the sales operations and customer success here at Cloud Essentials. And it is my pleasure to be your host today and welcome our experts who are joining me to talk through the discussion topics we've outlined in our agenda. I'm joined by Navasha, who is a tech savvy compliance specialist. Navasha, do you want to give yourself a bit of an introduction? Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Hi everyone. Um, as Holly said, my name is Navasha. I'm not sure about the tech savvy part, but uh, I'm a I'm a compliance um, the compliance lead of Cloud Essentials. Um, just a little bit about me. I am a um, designated compliance professional by the International Compliance, so um, yeah, certified compliance professionals as well as a certified or a designated compliance practitioner by the Compliance Institute of Southern Africa. Um, some of my experience, uh, I've worked as a compliance specialist within uh, the financial services industry um, within or subject to the jurisdiction of multiple multinational um, regulators, as well as working as a knowledge management consultant and a commercial legal advisor. So that's just a little bit about me. Thanks, Narasha. And Johan, our technical lead, would you like to give yourself an introduction? Thanks, Holly. Um, I'm Johan Panskalkrek. I'm the technical solution lead at Cloud Essentials. I'm a Microsoft certified professional in content management and security. Um, I have around 20 years of industry experience, um, obviously starting with on-premise um, corporate IT support and moving to cloud um, when that came around. Um, thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johan. So today we're going to work through some presentation content and also be active in the chat. So please feel free to type any questions you have in there. We will try to answer things if we can on the fly, but also make time at the end for a Q&A. We will also be launching some polls via Slido to capture your feedback and get some interaction going. So please also look out for that and use the code in the chat for submitting your responses. The aim of today's session is to bring you the benefits of our experience around managing the life cycle, life cycle of data uh, in Microsoft 365 in a practical way. It's a topic that I come across a lot because of my role within customer success. Um, I work with some very long standing customers who have really been on a journey with us for a long period of time through migration projects, mergers and acquisitions, adoption of Teams and SharePoint, changes in regulation, exploring generative AI, and a common theme with all of this that I see is lots of change. And it does feel like this keep it or delete it conversation continually crops up, which is why we're going to share our thoughts with you on firstly, the business case for taking action on lifecycle management, the why. Then Navasha will bring us pointers around defining policy. Johan will uh, give you a basic understanding on Microsoft Purview's native capabilities available to you and solutions also that sit around native capability like backup and archiving. We'll also look at ideas on being proactive with policy enforcement uh, at the point of creating new teams or collaboration workspaces. And finally, we'll wrap up with stories on where we've seen effective business buy-in for lifecycle management strategies. And at the end, we'll do a Q&A. But before that, I just wanna do a quick introduction to Cloud Essentials to set the scene. We are a long-standing Microsoft partner in the area of content management. So we work with organizations on their ongoing journey with all the data that they're accumulating in the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. We deliver professional services to migrate data, for example, from legacy on-premises or third-party platforms like document management systems, email archives, and file shares. And the topic of keep or delete always comes up in this context. We also deliver services to create the conditions uh, around the data to be managed in a compliant, secure and well-governed way. We have a unique offering for the adoption of Microsoft Purview, Microsoft's native um, solution for data security. And retention and deletion policies are often one of the first things that we tend to tackle. And we also deliver solutions to manage data such as backup and archiving for storage management. Again, decisions on lifecycle management are critical. 
Right, before I hand over to Navasha and Johan to share their knowledge, I'd also like to just touch on the business case for taking action of data lifecycle management and give you some of my observations. But first, I'd like to ask for your perspective by launching a Slido that asks you what is driving you to take action on retention and deletion. So please, can I ask you to share your driving factors into the Slido now? Uh, you can either use the code on the screen or there's also some more information on the chat. Um, I'd also just advise you to keep the Slido window open as we'll be using it again throughout the webinar. So we'll just wait for some responses to come through. We've got data sprawl. Data minimization. Yep. It's a business requirement. Risk as well. It's something you're tasked with uh, looking at. And regulations. Some some really interesting, yeah, retention versus backup costs. Thank you very much for yeah for sharing those insights. We've got some interesting responses and and a lot of themes that we'll hopefully touch on today. DSAR requests, risk management, perfect, and cost. Yeah, cost possible cost implications. Great. Thank you for that. So we want to talk to you about the business case today because we all know that in a perfect world, um, data lifecycle management can be difficult to achieve. It's often something that IT teams and data governance teams might well be aware of and, and might have even tackled in some way. But at the end of the day, it's often um, one of many objectives or issues that are all competing for time and budget and management from the business. and. Our experience is that at some point there can be a shift where the seesaw pivots and the cost of staying the same, perhaps having no retention or deletion um, and a wild west of data just becomes unacceptable. And organizations start to mobilize and take action despite the time, risk, cost and hassle of that investment, which you see on the right hand side of the seesaw. So first, I'm just going to share some insights on the triggers for change, which are on the left, and then we'll um, go through about getting buying and shifting the weight of these things on the right, which are uh, barriers to change. So moving on to triggers for change, uh, what we've seen as the most prevalent catalyst for implementing lifecycle management in Microsoft 365 is uh, that the cost of retention can be a trigger. So we've seen this in the context of migrating data into Microsoft 365, where the cost of migration or creating a suitable home for data in Microsoft 365 just isn't deemed worth it. Um, also in situations where clients have hit or are near to hitting their storage capacity and need to take action to avoid the, the hefty overage fees. Risk tolerances are often a trigger too. We've seen risk of non-compliance, such as uh, with data privacy regulation or regulation relating to financial conduct or standards like ISO 27001, uh, also triggering this data lifecycle management need. And acknowledgement that keeping unnecessary data constitutes as a risk of exposure. We've really seen a shift away from the keep everything forever um, attitude of the years gone by. Significant IT infrastructure changes also trigger this too, like mergers and acquisitions, uh, aligning disparate organizations and their systems. Uh, one project we worked on was driven from an e-discovery challenge and taking a proactive approach to data governance uh, to reduce the complexity and cost of e-discovery, which was causing them a big headache. And these are the triggers that we've seen to tackle, which are obviously problems, but data lifecycle management is also looked to as a business potential tool. For example, you know, the benefit of optimized data quality and quantity for generative AI, which is, as we know, becoming increasingly popular. 
and also getting more value from your Microsoft licenses. So many organizations are paying for lifecycle management capability, but it's just sat there dormant. Also contractual opportunities, for example, to meet requirements for industry standards to open doors to new business. Um, we've worked with a pharmaceutical company where a new contract around vaccinations really did spur them on to get and execute on data governance to up their game in that area. So as you can see, there can be lots of different catalysts, but organizations can be at very different levels of maturity. So the starting points at which they engage with us vary too. And one area we also always start with is under understanding existing policy uh, or building new policy, because ultimately that's what needs to play out in any technology you're using for data lifecycle management. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Navasha now so that she can guide us through that area of policy. To you. Thanks, Holly. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, and thank you for setting that, that backdrop for us, Holly, around the competing priorities and considerations from a business case perspective when it comes to um, tackling this data life or, or creating a data lifecycle management process, depending on how you see it. So I'll be unpacking um, in the next few slides some steps that an organization could take um, from a people and process perspective, but also to a limited extent, uh, a, technologi a technological perspective. And obviously, Johan's going to expand on that um, as we progress with this presentation. So starting with the key action of creating a policy and the considerations and actions that need to be taken throughout the process. Um, as we all know, data is one of the most valuable assets of an organization, but it also comes with significant responsibilities and risks. So just a bit of context, um, data retention, data deletion, and records management should be seen uh, ideally as three interrelated aspects of data governance. Um, to ensure and with the aim of ensuring that there's proper handling, storage and disposal of data in accordance with your legal and regulatory business requirements. So ideally, um, your process should cover all of these aspects um, to, to a certain extent. So data lifecycle management holistically is not just the best practice. It has become a, necess a necessity due to the high rise of privacy and data protection regulations, as some of you have pointed out even in our Slido, um, just the risks associated with, associated with it. And many regulations now require organizations, in addition to uh, you know, how they store it, to minimize the data they collect and store and delete unnecessary data upon request. Um, so this shift in mindset really, um, it recognizes that yes, data is a valuable a asset, but it's also a potential liability uh, from a legal and compliance perspective. So a data deletion and disposition program uh, for or defined is a formal process for now identifying and locating uh, and securely deleting data that is no longer needed or required, both from a legal perspective, but also from a business perspective, as, as Ollie outlined earlier. Uh, from a personal uh, data perspective, these programs are typically implemented to meet the requirements of various data privacy regulations. I think I'll be doing it an injustice to try and even name um, you know, the various instruments um, that are now in play, um, to, to name a few, the General Data Protection Act, oh sorry, General Data Protection Regulation, um, from a US perspective, the California Consum Consumer Privacy Act, and obviously from a South African perspective, the Protection of Personal Information Act. Um, so now that we've unpacked that, uh, we can move on to um, some of the, Sorry, we can, we can, yes, there we go. Uh, so I think now that we've unpacked that, we can move uh, at some of the challenges. We can move on to how we can make this process seem less impossible. Because I think sometimes when you, when you hear the concept and you hear about all the different processes you need to, um, or the foundations you need to put into place, it might seem overwhelming. Uh, but what we are attempting to do is to show you a more um, pragmatic, staggered approach, a structured approach, uh, taking or, or taking the form of a risk-based approach uh, because obviously 
most organizations now have a very vast data estate um, and, it's, and, and it would be impossible to tackle everything at once. Um, so taking a risk-based approach will mean to identify and assess the potential risks associated with the different types of data uh, and starting then to apply appropriate retention and deletion and records management policies and technologies uh, based on the level of risk. Uh, so for example, data that contains personal sensitive information or that is subject to legal or regulatory obligations may have a higher risk of uh, causing harm or attracting fines and penalties uh, and may be a greater liability if it's not properly uh, protected, retained, or disposed of. Um, therefore, such data may require um, stricter controls and longer retention periods versus data that might be less critical or less sensitive. So some of the factors, and I am going to unpack this a little bit later as well, but just to reiterate, some of the factors that can influence the level of risk in this risk-based approach is obviously the nature and content of the data, the purpose of it, uh, the context and the environment, as well as some of the consequences and impacts of that data, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned earlier, such as personal data. Um, so if we can move on, um, the, the slides that follow really take that risk-based approach, but make it practical to try and establish how would you go about defining a policy, taking into consideration policy ownership, uh, business need. So how do you actually unpack the business need? Um, and then once you've unpacked the need, how do you assess that uh, and, and try and form a starting point? And then lastly, uh, I'll unpack how you can execute um, on this on a policy um, once you follow this, the, the previous steps. So starting with a question that gets asked more often uh, than not in almost every meeting, uh, who needs to own this? Because there's often a lack of clarity uh, in the roles and responsibility when it comes to data lifecycle management, just due to the complexity um, and the changing nature of the data from collection to storage to deletion uh, and, and the different role players across that. So what we recommend is, is obviously data deletion and, and retention um, as well as records management is crucial components and should form uh, a great part of an overall data management strategy as well as the data protection strategy just due to um, the, the heavy or, or the heavy influence it would have in how you manage your data privacy regulations as well. So it should be integrated into this data management uh, strategy, as well as including transformation processes to effectively minimize risks and ensure compliance. Um, to achieve this integration, uh, organizations should consider um, the, well, you should need to define your data and data structures, understand data usage. But in addition to that, um, you need to acknowledge the fact that different people in an organization may have to deal with this process depending on how big or structured your organization is and also the types of data. So typically some of the roles and functions uh, we see would be um, data protection officers or privacy officers. Uh, they could sit within group compliance or they could be a team of their own. Um, if you have record managers or people in charge of archiving, then of course, from a technology perspective, it's, it's usually IT managers or security managers who who provide the technical infrastructure um, and the tools to help uh, provide um, or to help with rather data storage access, backup and deletion. There's also obviously business managers or project managers that, that have to keep track of the business case um, and, and just make sure that how and or how you execute on the strategy is consistent with your business processes and in line with your business strategy. So some organizations often choose to appoint a records management uh, professional or a team of information governance professionals if um, they're unable to do this. We have seen that, uh, or we have seen this role becoming more and more common um, amongst um, other organizations as well. So once we've unpacked that, uh, we can move on to how do you now understand what your business needs? because to address the operational needs as well as the legal and compliance needs, uh, you have to conduct some sort of assessment. So some of these might already exist in the form of compliance risk management plans or previous monitoring exercises, or even from a technology perspective, if a gap assessment was, was conducted. But to manage this holistically uh, and in 
uh, compliant manner. It, it's obviously, or, or it's best to leverage all of these things and, and, and bring that together. And the questions that we're going to ask now, going to outline now, um, help to bring together the various key areas um, so you can get a holistic picture of your of where you're at now with your data retention or your data lifecycle management rather. So firstly, you should establish whether a data classification is system is implemented. So is there some sort of technology that might already be at play um, that can help you distinguish various data types and their uh, respective retention durations? Then you should all, uh, should identify all legal requirements. So this might already exist in your regulatory universe or from your compliance team in some in sub shape shape or form. So this will need to include, uh, in addition to privacy legislation, if there if you might be subject to any industry specific regulations um, from a South African context, that could be finance, financial legislation, for example, from a human resources perspective or even accounting records. Um, so it's just about unpacking and understanding all of these requirements. You'd also need to, from a legal perspective, understand any contractual obligations or agreements you might have uh, or vendors that may influence your data retention periods. You'd need to confirm the existence of a data management or governance framework. So often we see organizations have started making progress on this uh, where they might have um, elements of data of, of data lifecycle management within existing policies. So it could be within a data privacy policy, within a retention schedule, uh, but but it's it normally needs to, or, or in this stage, you really need to bring all of that together uh, because you now need to encompass aspects like data access controls, data encryption, uh, and really just build on an existing strategy if one is in existence in your organization. Um, and then last but not least, you'll also need to verify the presence of systems or technologies capable of e efficiently managing and tracking data retention. And we're going to unpack that in much more detail later, um, just around Microsoft specific uh, capabilities. So this is where we think it's, it's, it's a good starting point. But then once you've established this, how do you now um, unpack or, or try and understand the extent of your exposure? So often, uh, Clients will conduct or clients will work with us would, would conduct a, a scan uh, across the environment to just try and understand where their data lives right now. Um, and we've broken this down into people, process and technology elements because, again, managing your data is not just one it's, it's not just it doesn't sit with one area. Uh, it can't only sit with compliance from a legal perspective and it can't only sit with technology teams from an implementation perspective. You will need to evaluate the business needs and the value of each data source and repository. So a lot of the work you've done in previous steps needs to come together, uh, but you'd also need to consider operational efficiencies, customer services, as well as business as usual, and then think of future growth like competitive advantage. In addition, uh, when developing and implementing your data retention strategy, you need to ensure that you're balancing the compliance, risk and value aspects of data governance um, and ensuring that it's consistent and effective application across your organization. So in as much as yes, you should start with a risk based approach. How does this now or this, uh, this, this policy and process you created, how does that filter through to the rest of the organization? Um, ensure and then ensuring that there's sufficient training and exposure or, or training and awareness rather um, so that people are aware of the extent of their individual exposure and uh, the risk they carry in managing the data as well. Um, and then moving on to how can you execute on this? And again, a big chunk of our webinar is going to cover technology, but just a little bit from my side. So a record management system, also known as uh, records and information management system is a solution uh, for organizations to manage regulatory, legal and business critical records um, and records management for Microsoft purview specifically, uh, which we're, we're going to unpack and it is the part of, or partly the subject of our webinar today, helps you achieve your organization's legal obligations. Uh, it provides the ability to, to demonstrate compliance with regulations. Uh, as you know, there are audit requirements within the various privacy regulations and being able to demonstrate how you comply is, uh, is very important. It's no longer a question of uh, implementing controls. You also need to be able to 
um, show how you're implementing that and demonstrate your compliance. So it's no longer enough to just have something in place. You also need to be able to show the effectiveness of those controls um, and, and the efficiency as well. Um, so yeah, on, on that note, I'm going to move on to, oh, I'm going to uh, hand you over to Johan, who's going to take you into more detail on Microsoft Purview and how it can assist you with executing on, on your policy. Thank you very much, Nivasha. So just to paint a picture of where we are today. So obviously Microsoft Purview is a unified data governance and information security suite of solutions that starts off with helping organizations not only understand and know their data and content a lot better through data discovery, but manage, protect and secure it throughout its life cycle up until the end of defensible deletion based on your requirements. But for today's session, we're focusing on the data governance life, the, the data governance life cycle solutions from Microsoft Purview, um, known as data life cycle management and records management. So jumping into it, I'm going to take you through four areas for each of those two solutions, starting off with data life cycle management. Um, but before we dive back into the technology side, maybe just back to Nivasha briefly, um, you've given us context of, of how to define policies, but why is data lifecycle management important from a compliance or governance perspective? Sure, thanks, Johan. Um, so Microsoft Purview Data Lifecycle Management, and formally, if if you're if people or, or our um, audiences away, it was formerly called Microsoft Information Governance. It provides you with tools and capabilities to retain the content you need um, to keep and then delete the content you don't. But in addition to this, it also helps you fulfill three conditions of lawful processing. Um, so it speaks to condition three, which is pur purpose specification. So personal information, as we know, must be collected for a, for a specific explicitly defined and lawful purpose that is related to the responsible party's functional activity. So records of personal information must not be retained any longer than is necessary to achieve this purpose. So there are obviously certain exceptions such as retaining personal information for statistical purposes, but the responsible party must ensure appropriate or establish appropriate safeguards that prevent the use of that data for other purposes that are not permitted. Um, the Act also, or, or legislation also provides that where a responsible party has used personal information to make a decision about that data subject, it must retain that record as required by law. Um, if there is no such law, or um, then the responsible party must retain the information for a period that will allow the data subject a reasonable opportunity to request it. So when the responsible party is no longer authorized to re retain that information, they must destroy, delete, or de-identify de it as soon as practically possible. Um, it also helps uh, fulfill condition five, which deals with the quality of personal information. So this condition requires the responsible party to take reasonable practicable steps to ensure that the information is complete, accurate, um, not misleading, and updated when necessary. So you have to obviously consider the purpose for which it is collected in meeting this condition. And then finally, uh, condition seven, which deals with security safeguards. So here specifically responsible parties have to ensure the, or have to secure the integrity and confidentiality of personal information by taking appropriate, reasonable, technical and organizational measures to prevent its loss, damage or unauthorized destruction. So responsible parties must also take measures to prevent unlawful access to personal information or to the processing of personal information. So the responsible party must have regard to generally acceptable or uh, accepted information security practices and procedures that may apply to it in addition to the conditions that we outlined as well. Thanks, Johan, back to you. Thank you very much, Devasha. So moving on what it does from a solution perspective. So Microsoft Data Lifecycle Management helps you manage information lifecycle obligations, like Nivasha mentioned, for data 
not only in Microsoft 365, but also external data sources um, that you can connect through built-in or custom graph API connectors. And it does it with the, some of the following capabilities. Um, firstly, it utilizes Microsoft 365 in-place management. On average, organizations are wrestling with five different content systems and repositories. Duplicate information across platforms not only causes productivity loss, but also increases risks. Um, In-place management enables companies to retain information where data is created to prevent productivity loss and reduce operational and legal risks by not copying to retain or copying to archive to a third party location. Um, automated policies um, is used to manage the volume of information as it expected to grow six times over um, the next couple of years. Um, relying on manual classification is ineffective since users usually care the most about the value of the information and less about the risks it generates. It's challenging to hold them accountable to classify and manage information accurately. Um, by utilizing the automated labels and automated policies, information governance um, that is built into purview, companies can leverage various automatic classification capabilities, such as file properties, and including content type defined in SharePoint Online, pattern recognition, um, library of words, and even machine learning classifiers to classify and govern data at scale to apply the appropriate retention and deletion activities. Um, purview data lifecycle management also includes a fully defensible process um, we, where multiple regulations such as FINRA require companies to meet stringent information governance requirements like record immutability is can use purview to demonstrate compliance with these regulations um, by having the ability to provide um, certification um, and a full audit trail on data um, deletion activities. I mentioned briefly before, um, you can extend the footprint and of control through built-in data connectors to third-party applications and data sources. So Microsoft not only has their own list of um, native connectors, but you can also work with third-party providers that has published connectors such as WhatsApp um, uh, and Veritas and other data locations. And in addition, companies and organizations have the ability to build their own custom graph API connectors to ingest data from other locations, such as on-premise files, shares, um, Azure file um, within blob storage, or even more structured data sources, such as SQL databases and document um, repositories. Um, some of the capabilities that Microsoft information governance and data lifecycle management provide you um, to enforce these policies are, are it allows admins to not only set up organization-wide policies, um, but users are also able to manually assign retention labels. Um, and as I mentioned before, then move on to utilize automation to automatically apply policies and labels to locations such as SharePoint sites or mailbox, um, exchange online mailboxes. I mentioned before, this can also be automated by using metadata and properties for, from files on these locations. Um, content type is one of a, a common one you see being used since many organizations already use this content type in SharePoint to categorize and manage the information based on the content type. Um, you can also apply labels automatically based on if the file contains specific keywords um, or leverage pattern recognition technology to identify files containing sensitive information types. Out of the box, Microsoft provides more than 300 out of the box patterns ready for use, such as credit card numbers, passport numbers, uh, and the like. 
And additionally, you can create your own custom sensitive information types. Um, modern sensitive information types like Turnable classifiers can then be used with the power of machine learning um, to identify documents um, with a broad, broader um, model um, that is built within the machine learning um, solution. And that can be used to identify documentation um, based on templates or fingerprinting, such as resumes, CVs, um, invoices, um, and even custom trainable classifiers that you can give to the Purdue machine learning engine to learn and then use those as your unique and custom trainable classifiers. Once the content is classified with retention labels or retention policies, um, the policy associated with that label or, or retention category would be enforced and you can configure um, policies to either retain or delete the content based on age, so years, months and days. Um, additionally, Microsoft provides several levels of immutability that you can configure within each of your labels or policies. It starts off with retention labels, which provide basic deletion prevention. Um, what that means is, is from a user perspective, it can be deleted, um, but it's still e-discoverable e e uh, and exportable through the e-discovery solution from Purview. But then it also includes record labels that prevent users from editing or deleting documents completely once they are classified as a label. And then lastly, the new regu regulatory record label um, where that can be used to further enhance the immutability by even blocking updates to metadata, restricting um, the upload or um, download of the file, and even preventing the um, administrators within Office 365 from making changes or removing the label completely. Um, after the content then reaches the end of its retention period, um, you can take action based on um, certain criteria, such as deleting it automatically or triggering a full native test position review. Um, and useful in this is you can utilize the power of Power Automate and the Power Platform to design your own disposition review process with alerts and approving um, and full integration through the graph API functionality. So you don't have to stick to the native Microsoft stage disposition process. You can really develop your own disposition um, workflow that works for you as an organization. And then lastly, you can choose the policy enforcement point to be based on a few event types um, or, or um, options. So you can trigger it on an event, again, through some automation and integration with third party data sources, such as an HR database where employee leaving the organization and departure date being um, uploaded to the HR platform. You can um, apply a retention label or policy on their content by following that event. But you can also apply a label once a file has been created, modified, or when a user manually applied a label. Um, when, when the policies um, needs to be enforced and the solution from Microsoft Purview um, data lifecycle management needs to be designed and translated, um, it's important to understand how the technology actually functions, um, as Nivasha alluded to earlier. And Microsoft has got a principle of retention wins over deletion in place, which essentially means if there are two conflicting retention policies or labels, um, retention will always ensure the content is retained, even if there's a, a delete action with a shorter period defined on the, and applied to a file. It just simply means it will be deleted from a user's view, um, but it will still be retained because of the longer retention period um, in the substrate within Microsoft 365, where it can still be rediscovered. Um, and export it um, through the e-discovery functionality and the content search functionality. Um, here we've seen a, a combination of legal opinion, um, whether that is um, 
good enough if items are retained, um, but it is removed from the general population's view, especially if, with regards to diesels. We've had legal opinion from clients saying nitrate must be permanently purged, not even discoverable in, in certain regions. And other clients in other regions, um, they, their legal opinion that they got was that it was sufficient if it was managed um, and only accessible through a, a controlled um, and um, role-based access like subject to purview e-discovery functionality. Um, to assist with this design, uh, when you start building your purview record and retention policies, uh, Microsoft has a graph uh, and a flowchart that they have published that you can use as organization to understand how labels, retention policies, and deletion actions works together and, and what will be the end results once all the policies and labels uh, and workflows have applied to that specific location or file type. We always use this when we assess clients with the implementation and onboarding of purview data loss like management retention policies and labels. Moving on to where to find it. So most of you should be aware um, Microsoft Purview is um, accessed through the Purview Administrative Center from a administrative or infrastructure um, and IT perspective. And that can be access accessed from the URL compliance.microsoft.com. But if you've been following Microsoft, which I believe most of you have, even Purview is going through a portal change um, where at the end of this year, uh, the Microsoft Purview portal will combine the legacy Azure Purview and the Microsoft 365 Purview portal into a single dashboard. And then the URL will be just purview.microsoft.com. But once you are in this portal with the right permissions and roles assigned to you, your account, Data Lifecycle Management has got its own administrative location at the bottom where you'll create the labels and manage everything around the solution. I'll give a brief overview of this when we get to the live demo later on today. Cool. Just jumping over to records management. So um, back to you, Nivasha. Um, why is records management um, specifically important from a regulation or compliance perspective? Yep. Uh, thanks, Johan. So the main objectives of records management is to comply with legal obligations, as we are aware, uh, but it also helps to support business operations and decision making while preserving historical and evidential records. So the principles and the conditions that we described earlier um, can only be enhanced or compliance rather with those conditions can only be enhanced by implementing an effective records management um, policy and, and process. Um, some of the benefits really are enhancing accountability and transparency, facilitating audits and investigations, as well as helping to enable the business to get or, or to help analyze their, their data and, and create a valuable insight by protecting intellectual property uh, as well as trade secrets. So from a legislative perspective, we see, uh, well, there's extensive requirements both from a, from well, locally from a South African perspective as we see section 14 of Papaya uh, or the Protection of Personal Information Act that prescribes the requirements for retention and restriction of records, uh, but also in terms of the GDPR with Article 30 uh, quite comprehensively stating what you'd need to comply with uh, in order to show effective uh, and compliance records uh, or records management. So some of the challenges, of course, that are faced with records management, and I see some of the comments on the chat as well, it's being able to define and um, apply records criteria and categories, um, ensuring record quality and integrity, as well as protecting record security and privacy, uh, while also bearing in mind, you know, turnover of organizations while still managing your records lifecycle and disposition. So I'm hoping you hand in the slides that follow, you're going to help uh, describe and unpack the Microsoft solution that can hopefully help with um, uh, quite a bit of those challenges. Thank you, Nirasha. 
Um, yeah, so getting right into the into that, yeah, I mean, to that, um, what does record management from Microsoft Purview provide organizations? Um, um, and again, record management in Purview is a built in solution. Um, already, your organization or most organization is already utilizing the Microsoft 365 and broader um, environment. Um, and historically, record management solutions have impeded end user productivity, making it complicated to use, manage, and enforce. Um, I think Microsoft 365 built in record management capabilities helps organizations to seamlessly classify, retain, review, dispose, and manage content according to these um, specific regulation and retention schedules um, without compromising user productivity. Um, that means that the native record management capabilities can enforce more rigorous immutability at the storage level um, beyond just role-based permissions or permission settings and user interfaces. At the same time, Microsoft 365 record management enables admins and end users to apply built-in controls within the productivity apps and the existing customer workflows easing the friction that often happens between applications of proper data governance and being productive. Um, Microsoft Purview record management is also intelligent. Um, the exponential growth of data is challenging, oh, sorry, is changing the way people work. Um, new modern ways of creating data and easy methods for sharing and collaborating data is seeing the proliferation of data at faster rates than any point in the past. And this makes it challenging to apply the appropriate governance policies at scale. As data grows exponentially and organizations increasingly manage dark, unstructured data, manual processes are not scalable or reliable, which can increase compliance and security risk. Leveraging the purview intelligence um, based on machine learning capabilities um, and automatically applying the appropriate labels and policies makes it a lot simpler. Um, I've already mentioned defensibility um, within lifecycle management um, and record management just further enhances this by being able to safely dispose of content um, where all actions performed by record managers, employees, and IT administrative tasks are recorded in the Microsoft 365 audit log. And you are able to provide um, certification that content has been disposed of as part of this uh, Microsoft preview record management disposition process. Where to find it? So yeah, jumping back again to the purview, um, administrative center, the same as data lifecycle management, record management also has got its own administrative location where you can configure file plans, the label policies, um, and all the other information around that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll stop sharing the presentation and just start sharing my screen so we can do a live demo for you as part of today's session. So I want to give you two perspectives, firstly from an administrative perspective briefly, and then what actually end users will see um, when you have labels and attention policies in place. So starting off, I'm in the preview admin center here. Um, out of the box, you can get some metrics around how labels are being used in your organization. You can also do further enhancements of this um, in content search and activity logs, but I won't go into that detail today. But in here is where you will define, your administrators will define your labels where you define your retention or deletion requirements, um, and also your retention policies, um, that, that is more uh, implicit policy. Um, if I jump quickly, briefly to records management, the same will apply for records, uh, for record management, you'll get information and metrics back on the use cases and usage of la record labels in your organization. But 
people with review and um, disposition review and data ownership permissions will access this dashboard and administrative location to perform disposition activities as part of their day to day um, operations. But just jumping to um, uh, end user perspective, I bring my machine over. So I'm logged in as a user, Megan Bath Bowen, um, and I have the ability to, within SharePoint and OneDrive location, as I mentioned before, manually apply labels to content. So here I'm um, in my, the user's OneDrive location, and by simply clicking on the the three dot um, menu and expanding the details bar on the left, oh, sorry, on the right hand side, the user has got the ability to manually choose which retention label they want to apply to files that is stored within SharePoint and OneDrive um, as part of that integration. Within your mailbox, so that's just an example of a manual label. And you can also, as I mentioned before, utilize automated labeling. So I'm going to simulate that by jumping to the web view of another user in this organization. And I have a label set up that must ensure a retention policy applied to any content that contains credit card information. So if this user sends an email to another user in the organization, or even externally that contains credit card information, that label will automatically be applied to that message. Uh, I've sent that email to Megan. If I jump to her, her outlook um, and I select that new email, as an end user can already see at the top that the retention policy based on the um, retention requirements has already been applied to this email and it will be automatically deleted within um, after three years. Um, the same happens on record labels. Um, it will, once you apply a, a record to a file, a label to a file, it just means that the file will not be editable um, with whoever the file is shared with or accessed unless that label is unlocked. So just jumping back to the presentation. So uh, I think I'll hand over back here to Nivasha um, that will discuss uh, or compare um, retention versus archive with his delete. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Um, if we can just, yep, so this is uh, always something we, we like to ask our audience. So do you um, do you know your current rate of data growth? Uh, and then we've just got a, 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 some stats here, just speaking to there's over a oh, 270 million monthly active uh, Microsoft Teams users. Um, and then just on average, globally, every human uh, creates at least 1.7 uh, megabytes of data every second. So just something that, or just some facts that we thought, uh, or little anecdotes that we thought might uh, interest people. Um, yeah, and then, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to um, just the, the, the differences. Um, Johan, I think again, in the interest of time, we can, oh yeah, we're we going to cover uh, what are you doing to manage the cost of retention in Microsoft 365? I know this is quite a wide question, but you'll see that we have um, provided you with some options. So please, can you engage in our, in our Slido?
Okay, just gonna start um, reading some of the responses coming through. Apologies for the slight delay on my side. Um, Majority so seems we, to be running ad hoc, manual deletion, or nothing. Yeah. I think those are the biggest, the biggest. Yeah, winners. I see a lot of responses for nothing. Uh, so that's a little bit concerning. Um, so I'm going to just unpack the differences between uh, retention versus backup versus archiving, uh, because this is a question that we get a lot. Um, we can just move on to the next slide uh, from our clients, because as we know, there's a lot of um, well, there's a lot of new vendors and projects and cho or and choices around um, your data lifecycle management nowadays. But uh, and that was obviously before Microsoft, where um, there were very clear solution categories. So some principles to go by. Um, so you need Microsoft 365 retention management because um, you need to control the length of time you keep content content, control, control the availability, um, and prove its immutability. So your use of retention management features obviously enable you to do this. You would need a Microsoft 365 backup solution because despite all the prevention effort, uh, life happens, your content, uh, and you need to consider that your content might, might still be at risk of being stolen or lost, corrupted. So you need to arm yourself with restoration capabilities. And then lastly, you'd need um, Microsoft 365 archiving because capacity is being consumed at such a rate as we um, as we showed on, on, on previous slides in Microsoft 365 that you might be hitting limits uh, or paying overage fees and the price at which you're paying for bytes and capacity might not be uh, cost efficient. So if you're choosing an archiving solution, um, it should be 100% integrated with your retention policies and labels as well. It should also be noted that um, that all these solutions, there's, there's space for all of this in your data management um, strategy. Um, and both backup and retention preserve content, but for completely different reasons. So your backup solution must not compromise your retention strategy or compliance obligations. Um, because by definition, a backup is a copy of your content, so it must still fi fall in line with your retention schedule. So on that note, back to you, Johan, um, to close out with some lifecycle management in Microsoft Teams. Thank you, Nivasha. Uh, I think we want to highlight lifecycle management in Teams. I think most organizations uh, had to adopt uh, Microsoft Teams as a collaboration platform following the impact of COVID. Um, and yeah, we feel a lot of organization um, still battling with managing Teams and sprawl with the content and collaboration platform within Microsoft Teams. And it really starts off at the creation step, um, where before creating a new team in Microsoft Teams, it is crucial to have clearly defined goals for that team. This ensures that the team is purposeful, aligned with the organization objectives and set up for success. And this will avoid team sprawl and creating unnecessarily and unused team sites. A, a team template in Microsoft Teams is a definition of a team structure um, designed around a business need or project. As, as, as an admin, and within your organization, you can use templates to easily deploy consistent teams across your organization. With templates, your users can quickly create rich collaboration um, with predefined settings, channels, and apps based on that template. Uh, native governance in Microsoft Teams involves establishing policies and procedures to manage and control the creation, usage, and maintenance of teams environments within the organization. It includes setting up naming conventions, defining roles and permissions, implementing approval process for teams creation and enforcing compliance with organization and regulatory requirements. And the management of Microsoft Teams utilizes the usage monitoring um, is a, as an integral aspect of management and preventing the sprawl within teams um, as it offers a powerful insights into how each team is being used. 
there are both built-in analytics and custom reporting options available that will give you inputs on the usage pattern other users have within Microsoft Teams. Keeping track of changes with access reviews um, within Microsoft Azure can also help control who has access to what resources within Microsoft Teams. With this, you can control and manage external guest access and access of those that are no longer with the organization or collaborate with from a third party perspective. And then lastly, the lifecycle management of teams needs to incorporate an end of life solution. As teams fulfill their purpose, it's crucial to manage their life cycle to prevent sprawl in the environment. Implementing expiration policies can help achieve this. By setting an expiration date for each team, you ensure that team owners remain accountable. If a team is not renewed by the expiration date, it can be automatically deleted. For content preservation, consider archiving teams from the admin portal. Archiver makes all teams content read and then hides it from the rest of the organization. The team can be reactivated if needed, ensuring no content is lost. Additionally, third party tools can enhance team lifecycle management. These tools monitor content usage, archive it while my <laughs> archive it while maintaining the team structure and provide easy restoration methods. Archived content can be moved to external storage, such as blobs, freeing up your allocated SharePoint storage. By implementing these strategies, you can effectively manage your team's end of life cycle, maintaining organization efficiently and optimizing storage usage. Um, I think I'm gonna hand back now to Holly, just to conclude the business case and wrap today's session up for us. Thank you, Johan, and thank you, Navasha. I know we're out of time, but I can still see some people uh, and engagement live. So I'm going to continue on and just wrap up. And I just wanted to quickly take us back to the business case uh, slide, if you wouldn't mind, Johan, and remind you of the visual we had earlier for the balance of investment in data lifecycle management. And where we've seen our clients be most successful with the business case is where we've uh, where they've not only aligned it with the strategic outcome that the business wants, but also made the work involved um, less daunting because it can be a daunting thing. And they they've done this by doing things like illustrating the return on investment as a quant as quantifiable as possible, which I'll come back to in a second. Also by presenting the risk-based approach that focuses on protecting the crown jewels or tackling top priority data and not trying to take on the entire data estate. And also by promoting the capability and technology to minimize time and effort uh, by using automation, which Johan spoke to as well. Uh, and then if we just move on to uh, the next slide, also, if life cycle, data lifecycle management can show a cost saving, obviously that can also be a really compelling factor. Uh, for example, by avoiding expensive overage fees from SharePoint or enforcing retention to demonstrate compliance with business critical information. And to wrap up with some key takeaways from today's session, we've talked about the many drivers that we see for tackling retention management, where the more aligned it is to a strategic outcome, the better. Navasha, you've advised us not to tackle all data at once, but rather build the policy foundations and then take a risk-based approach to prioritizing. Johan, you've explained what the technology has to offer natively from Microsoft, as well as the third party solutions that complement um, life, life cycle management, uh, like archiving and backup. And as always, our best practice advice is to create an achievable roadmap over a period of time um, that you can do step by step. So that brings us to a close. I hope you found the session today useful. We really appreciate it if you could complete our short survey just to capture some, capture some feedback, which I believe is launching in the chat now, which is via Slido. We've also provided some further reading material. Again, links to this are in the chat. We, I also want to mention that we offer a Microsoft 365 Purview Journey workshop. So if you're interested in that, you can get in touch with Navasha or myself. And you can stay up to date with our monthly advice and purview related topics by signing up to our monthly newsletter if you're not already. And you can follow the QR code on the screen for this or type the URL into your web browser or alternatively find us on LinkedIn. 
And I just wanted to say it's been a real pleasure bringing you this webinar today and we hope you enjoyed it and that you can join us for our upcoming ones in the future, which can all be found on our website.